Oh, greetings. I am doing another live recording here, uh, and this time it's going to be in a webinar format. Unfortunately, I did this uh, in service earlier today, and what happened was I plugged the microphone into the headphone jack instead, so none of my audio came out. So um, everything is just all silent. Rather than making uh, rather than making a uh, a voiceover, I decided to just do a video video lecture. Okay, so hang on, let me get this going. If you look at the title, you can imagine my in-service will now cover how to apply current scientific evidence into your plan of care. And I was surprised to find out, uh, on average, that it takes about seven to ten years for current evidence to emerge in our treatments as medical practitioners, and it may sometimes even take decades before treatments proven to be ineffective or even harmful are removed from our system. So I understand that most of us do not have time to read the two to three research papers on a daily basis just to keep up with today's rapidly changing pace. But the good news is, is that um, we are not physicians. And why is that? Because according to Majid et al. in 2011, it is estimated that around 8,000 articles back then uh, relevant to family practice were published monthly. And a family medicine practitioner would need to dedicate approximately 20 hours a day in order to stay abreast of new evidence. So in 2020, which is really only about six months away from now, medical knowledge is projected to double in just 73 days. And according to Denson, 2011 is expanding faster than our ability to assimilate and apply it effectively. So this is not really an easy task for a single person to do, and that's why I'm so glad that every month that comes up here, uh, we have new content. And I want to take this opportunity to give Mike S. a golf clap for really filling every month with great content that is current. Now, uh, because this is going to be on the interweb, uh, I thought that uh, a disclaimer would be appropriate since it's going to be broadcasted out. Uh, this, the views uh, over here uh, are going to be my thoughts, my opinions expressed in this text belong sol solely to the author and not necessarily the author's employer, organization, committee, or any other group or individual. So evidence, and evidence constantly evolves, and I wanted to highlight that the information I uh, mentioned today or bring up today uh, is really only for today. All right? uh, I have... Um, and nothing I've mentioned in the past or will mention in the future, you know, uh, pertain to anything I say right now. So some of these slides are also not originally mine, but I included them with consent, of course, from uh, the original authors, only because the people who created them are much more intelligent than I am, and they did a really good job with these infographics and getting their message across. Now, and finally, I would also like to apologize in advance for anyone who may be offended with what I have to say because sometimes presenting cold, hard science may feel downright insulting, uh, especially when it challenges strong beliefs or biases. And I want to make it clear that this is not an attack on anyone's belief. It's merely pointing out what is and what is not currently accepted as scientific evidence. Uh, our, our objectives today are going to be one, updating our evidence-informed treatment of musculoskeletal low back pain. The other one is going to be knowing the cost of not applying uh, evidence in medical practice. And this, this goes beyond uh, just maybe talking about pain, low back pain, uh, the financial impact and social impact also of what low back pain is uh, within the lives of our patients. And three is using safe language when uh, communicating with our patients. Now, quick question over here I took uh, as a show of hands, who thinks modern medicine is doing a good job with treating low back pain? Uh, actually, <laughs> earlier when I brought this up, not a whole lot of hands came up. And uh, who thinks we are doing a poor job? Oh, maybe two hands came up. Uh, so the poor job won on that crowd. Now this is a small snapshot of the direction low back pain continues to head and my goal this afternoon uh, is to help swing this trend hopefully in a better direction. Uh, maybe not globally but even just in our in our town of Whittier or city of Whittier. Uh, and part of the reason low back pain is getting worse is because of the way that we treat this disease. You know Lewis and O'Sullivan in 2018 believed one of the major problems 
are from structural changes observed on imaging that are highly prevalent in pain-free populations such as rotator cuff tears, intervertebral disc degeneration, labral tears, cartilage changes are ascribed to individuals as a diagnosis for their condition. In this context, the information may result in the individual believing that their body is damaged, fragile, and in need of protection, resulting in a cascade of movement and activity avoidance behaviors and seeking interventions to correct the structural deficits. I also feel that we are treating a symptom of back pain rather than a medical diagnosis, which makes it much more complicated because treating symptoms like pain, fear, anxiety, depression, happiness, joy, love, etc., are so multifactorial. And this means that pinpointing a single cause within the body is, is going to be too minimalistic. So furthermore, including the anatomy of the back and the low back pain may insinuate that the body part is where the pain is originally from. I want to make it clear that the body can experience pain, but cannot produce it without the mind. Therefore, it is important that we eventually clarify to our patients where pain comes from. There are two main reasons why I also see back pain is worsening, and the first one is possibly the language, the words I often hear. This includes maybe actions of tone of voice and body language, uh, create and instill noticeable beliefs in patients. You know, the other big reason back pain is worsening is because we are all taught in school to begin by choosing to provide clients the lowest value treatments first, leaving high value treatments to be applied last. For example, we often uh, focus on the items on the top of this pyramid when developing a treatment plan rather than the items at the bottom uh, over here, which have much greater impact and create more of a solid foundation to build on. So what does the evidence pyramid sound like when you apply it in the clinic? You know, we focus on the bottom of the pyramid, um, and you see this pyramid was uh, provided by Physio Meat Science, the red circle that I placed over there. Uh, you want to focus on that because most of the options at the top are passive and foster an external locus of control, and the lower value, and, and they lower the value of PT. You know, we should begin by developing a rapid therapeutic alliance using the listening and communication skills we, po we pointed out in our 2017 Partnership Counselor Project. Uh, making eye contact using acronym ADET, which is acknowledge, introduce yourself, or acknowledge the patient, introduce yourself, tell them the duration of what the evaluation is going to be, uh, explain what you're going to do in the evaluation, what the outcomes are, and also thank you at the very end. Uh, to make Strong first impression, really important, mirroring our clients, etc. This will allow us to find out what the patient's interests, expectations, and goals are. You know, this will be covered much, much more in detail later on. Uh, we're going to move on to the conversational education, explanation of our findings, reassure that considering lifestyle changes will lead to better outcomes, guide them away from falling into the fear avoidance cycle. Now, how effective is PT? We saw the graph earlier in which was uh, two slides ago representing of how all of medical practitioners are doing. So it's really not fair to point out the finger, well really point the finger at us as a movement rehab specialist based on that. You know, so th that one was based on the physician's outcomes. But at the same time when you base the physician's outcomes, really you're, you're, you're basing in all of us as a whole since even the physicians end up um, uh, they still refer to us right now uh, in, in Southern California, and especially because we're in a hospital setting. And whenever the physician is involved, it's the entire, uh, I guess, team that the umbrella that they cover is, is also involved. Uh, now, I, now I generally consider myself a pretty positive guy, and I know it's better to really steer away from negative news, but I had to read some of the articles for the pros and cons of our profession in order to better understand what I can do to progress it. And the first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one, and it's according to Zig Ziglar. Now, Frost and Lamb in 2004 concluded that routine physiotherapy seemed to be no more effective than one session of assessment and advice from a physiotherapist. So the findings of this study suggest to me, at least, that the kind of advice that we tell our patients during the initial evaluation may be much more powerful than we imagine, even more powerful than the remaining sessions we have afterwards, especially if it's, if it's making that much of a change that is the equivalent of seven treatments afterwards if we've got eight that have been scheduled. 
You know, this does not mean we completely neglect what we do as PTs, however, uh, and we end up just so focusing on what we say. Uh, the ISPI team tweeted last month, 6-11-19, that pain neuroscience education, p &E, must be combined with active interventions like PT in order to be effective. Now, the study this Twitter conversation was centered around was done by Lowe et al. in 2019, who found immediately after intervention, low back pain and leg pain improved significantly, but the mean change did not um, exceed the minimal clinical important difference, you know, which was 2.0. They were testing straight leg raises. So active trunk flexion significantly improved with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, with the mean improvement of 4.7 centimeters exceeding the MC, uh, MDC, minimal detectable change. Straight leg raise significantly improved to the P equal to 0 0.002, but mean change did not exceed the MDC. So this might explain why we see so many of our patients getting better while they are, while we're treating them uh, inside the clinic. You know, however, when we discharge them to continue on their own and they're armed with a home exercise program in their hand and they're looking at their pictures and all of a sudden, they come back maybe three, four months later, and I've been guilty of this, but the first thing that runs through my head is, well, they must not have been doing their home exercise. They must not have been compliant to it. Otherwise, they would have kept getting better, right? And I, I, um, I want to point out that we sometimes have to be careful with this type of thinking, especially me. You know, just imagine the trust our patients have in us and putting their bodies in our hands and their lifestyle in our hands. They are, um, they are treated as human beings, not necessarily body parts, and it's the bio, the psycho, the social that allows us to treat them as a human being, not just as an image on a radiograph, but not just as a body part like a leg, a knee, you know, treating a shoulder or a hand. We treat all of them, and um, that's what this model is going to end up encompass, encompassing that we, we kind of uh, expand a little bit on later on. So remember to keep in mind, that our biologic exercises, body mechanics, etc., etc., cannot be separated you know, from psychological and social issues. Uh, on the other note, we are supposed to also do things with our patients that they cannot do for themselves at home. Uh, and this is supposed to happen during treatments. And we mentioned this a little bit in Partnership Counselor in order to try to maybe decrease the amount of no-shows and cancellations. You know, so we have to be careful with this approach because it may also imply that patients may end up increasing dependency on us rather than leading patients down the healthier path of independence. So we must also learn how to be able to balance this because there's a need, a mutual need between patients having to come to us, <laughs> us needing to see them, and them needing us to be able to help coach and take care of them also. You know, so. In order to do so, some other outcome tools that might be very helpful are the Orebro and the Start Back tools, and I want to have everyone become a bit more familiar with them. They're in the file cabinets in the office. Uh, and the reason that you want to become familiar with this is because our new SCC uses these screening tools on their patients, and Mike L. may be referring some of them to us, uh, some of the patients that are going to be much longer than just acute care and may become subacute care or even uh, long-standing care. This way we can keep the education consistent and our terminology consistent and our system consistent uh, with continuing where they left off from the SCC. Now what happens when we tell patients that they have back pain because of severe degeneration? Uh, what happens when we tell them that their SIJ or hips are not aligned? And what happens when we tell people that their pain is because a disc is bulging and pinching a nerve? You know. First of all, these statements for most cases have not yet been proven to be the cause of back pain. Therefore, it may be possible for patients who become better informed of current medical evidence to lash out against statements we tell them that are not accurate. According to Panting G in 2004, keeping up to date is another important and related issue. Medical practice is constantly evolving. Using outdated techniques inevitably makes practitioners vulnerable to crit criticism. So we may, be, we may be placing ourselves at a risk for negligence when applying unproven treatments or educating using words known to create harmful beliefs. You know, the list of patient complaints seen here in the background uh, of this slide is pretty lengthy and it was published last month in the OC Register. 
Uh, O'Sullivan mentioned earlier that the downfall of using an anatomic finding like DJD or DDD as a medical diagnosis. You know, this may lead patients into believing again that their primary diagnosis is the cause of their pain. Uh, then when clients want to know about pain, we begin to teach them about the anatomy and biomechanics because, you know, that's what we learned in school. That's all we were taught. So what's the harm in teaching patients that? You know, really the worst thing that can happen is that unproven information, uh, you know, known, can be known to promote nocebo effects. And um, this is, especially happens in patients who suffer from pain. More shanty in... Um, 2017, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2010, mentioned that pathologic models framework increase fear in patients. Green Appel et al. in 2005 uh, further stated that these models show limited efficacy in decreasing pain and disability, but they may increase fear in patients, which in turn may increase their pain. Now, furthermore, biomedical education cannot explain pain because it does not include the nervous system, the brain, or pain processing and uses terminology that promotes fear. You know, so finally, why else is it important for us to teach pain? You know, Lowe et al. in 2009 and 2016 um, noted that patients are interested in pain and should be educated more about it. 76% of clients that undergo back surgery because of pain, and I suspect this also includes uh, all pain in the body, 97% uh, of patients indicated on a survey that the preoperative education they received was beneficial, yet only 37% of them felt that they received adequate information on pain. You know, worst of all, when our patient ends up Googling uh, their condition, because according to Green et al. in 2005, less than 10% of information found on the internet about disc herniation is relevant. And more than 90% of the words and pictures that you, f you find on the internet are irrelevant and may promote fear to form pro-inflammatory cytokines to pro to, to promote and, sort of, uh, and, and further sensitize their alarm systems. You know, and this, this goes with us, that when we use an anatomic model, we grab a spine, we show a picture of a disc herniation, we show a picture of a shoulder impinging, that those type of bioanatomical and biomedical explanations and pictures are the ones that fuel more fear into our uh, persistent pain patients with low back pain. Now, what happens when modern pain medicine using nocebo beliefs introduced to people uh, with low back pain? You know, so let's take a look at this example. This study by Lynn et al. in 2013 found that Aboriginal men and women um, in Australia held predominantly negative beliefs about chronic low back pain arising from healthcare interactions with medical specialists, general practitioners, physiotherapists, chiropractors, um, negative and negative beliefs were most common among those who were disabled and suggest that chronic low back pain disability is partly iatrogenic. This study includes 32 Aboriginal people with chronic low back pain who were highly moderately and mildly disabled. Now the results of this study were that most participants held biomedical beliefs about the cause of low back pain, attributing pain to structural anatomical uh, vulnerability of their spine. This belief was attributed to the advice from healthcare practitioners and the results of spinal radiologic imaging. Negative causal beliefs and a pessimistic future outlook were more common among those who were more disabled. You know, and conversely, those who were less disabled had more positive out, uh, had, had more positive beliefs that did not originate from interactions with healthcare practitioners. Basically, <laughs> you sum it all up, the people with less disability were not exposed to a Western medical practitioner. Belief in the cause of pain seemed to be an issue. More than half the participants believed that there were one or more structural or anatomical problems of their spine that were responsible for the cause of their pain. You know, the majority attributed pain to damage of the disc wear and tear of the spine. They gave me an example, or I'm sorry, they says one of them, they gave me an x-ray of lower back and um, it's all worn down. Although this belief was expressed by those of varying levels of disability, this was the most common to those who were highly disabled. Uh, so he continues on saying, uh, one of the test subjects, well I got told by the medical specialist that it might be a trapped nerve or uh, that was before I had my first MRI and 
that they said that you've got lower lumbar and I said it's it's just bone on crunching on bone you know, and this was a 42 year old man with highly disabling low back pain it's so a little bit more uh, from another test subject and what she had to say uh, quote and the physio and Cairo were both saying that it could be a hint of arthritis so I went and got x-rays and I think it was a CAT scan or an MRI and I had done on my back and when they found out that it was arthritis in the L4, L5 vertebrae and it hasn't been getting any better since then. You know, when I first found out, they put me on a prescription medicine. Okay, and this is a 26-year-old man with moderately disabling low back pain. The results of spinal radiological imaging were central to what participants believed was the cause of their pain. You know, because now they've got, they've got picture proof of what's going on in there is what they thought. You know, for several men who were moderately or highly disabled, these explanations based on radiologic imaging findings adversely affected their emotional well-being. So, says another, at first I felt a bit weird with them telling me I had arthritis in that, and I thought it was a bit of a joke. Then they showed me the x-rays and that MRI, CAT scan, whatever it was. It was a bit depressing and a bit shocking being young and finding out you've got arthritis. It wasn't too good. You know, on the lower part, I've got no natural gel, so it's bone crunching on bone, and I've got no coccyx bone too. Hmm. That was after my last MRI. Okay, so, interviewer says, "Well, how does that make you feel with your back?" And uh, he responded with, "Depressed, depressing." You know, so some participants recounted a diagnosis that they had been given many years previously, how highlighting how some advice from a healthcare practitioner can have long, long-lasting influence on back pain. You know, for example, um, R6, or test subject 6, discussed her belief in a slip disc after interactions with medical specialists 30 years previously. That dog said, I had a slip disc, and it all depends on how movements or your lifting, you know, says a 55-year-old woman with mildly disabling low back pain. The belief of anatomical cause of pain was commonly associated with other negative beliefs about pain, such as inevitable negative future consequences of pain. These beliefs were pronounced, although not a unique feature, of those with higher levels of disability. I've already got them, the damage. It's, it's there for the rest of my life, says another respondent. Right, so, after listening to all those depressing statements, I do want to make it clear that modern Western medicine is not bad or evil. Uh, it's not here to destroy us all. It is actually designed to significantly extend and save lives. If it wasn't for modern medicine, we wouldn't be living as long as we're living right now. You know, what makes our jobs even better and more important in our, medis in our medical system is that we are here to teach people how to live again who have had their lives extended. Now, I included this to also show that promoting maladaptive behavior is not just limited to the spine. And what happens when we tell people to never walk around barefoot or wear supportive shoes all the time? There's two recent journals that came out this month, one by Lieberman in April 2019 and another one uh, by Hannigan and Pollard, I think it was just this month, that continues to show the idea that adding more protection to our body is not always helpful for reducing stress injuries. You know, the two take-homes I've, I've learned from these studies, uh, reading them, is that we may possibly break something when trying to fix what wasn't broken to begin with. Also, protective devices, when used for a long period of time, may end up allowing people to adapt into becoming weak, which can make them more fragile. Clinical practice guidelines here are the foundation of the APTA and how they would like to build physical therapy's identity from evidence-influenced movement specialists. You know, this is the most current guideline we have by the APTA for low back pain. And unfortunately, if you look at the date on it, it was re last revised in 2012. But despite its old age, um, in 2019, Lynn, Wiles, and Waller rated this CPG still as high quality. You know, so out of curiosity, I was asking the crowd here who who uses this uh, already, or who uses this as a guide for back pain? Uh, so one, I think, uh, lifted his hand as far as um, raising her hand. Kudos to him. Yeah, he should got him a sticker. 
But according to Benekewik, George, Greco, et al., in 2019, systematic review findings indicate that healthcare providers with predominantly biomedical treatment orientations are more likely to suggest limited work and physical activity and are less likely to adhere to clinical practice guidelines. You know, in order to promote an increase in using this CPG, I thought it might be a good idea to begin by telling patients that their back, shoulder, hip, you know, et cetera, hurts more uh, because of things beyond their posture, things more than pinching or tightness or weakness alone. The clinical guidelines suggest that applying the ICF um, model, uh, which has been a part of initial evaluation since I believe like 2017 or maybe even 2016, um, is, is great. All right? So we're already on board with part of the CPG. Now, Benekewik et al. in 2019 also suggests that using risk stratification approach for low back pain, which uses the nine item start back tool to screen for modifiable, modifiable prognostic factors, determine patient risk for developing persistent low back pain related disability, and to use the information to match patients with different care pathways. You know, we already know that um, that, that uh, stratification for patients and qualifying and quantifying them in the categories that uh, we can best treat them works out really well. You know, so uh, that is something the uh, the Spine Care Center is already doing that we should also, I think, look into. Which of the tools should I keep? You know, again, this is a really tough question because. Um, uh, the, the answer is tough because even the low-value tools that we use and that are not recommended by the APTA can also work well with relieving our patient's pain. They, they walk out of here happy. You know, it's difficult to get rid of tools that appear to help people, you know, who, who leave feeling better and who may eventually want to raise our satisfaction, of course, because they're happy with how they feel. You know, but this is just often a short-term pain reduction or modulation. I do want to point out that many of the passive modalities you see here and in the, in the next slide afterwards are associated with making people weak and again in my opinion more fragile in the long term. You know, several experts on social media have been trying to rid our profession of passive treatments uh, and I, I, think, um, I, I think that's going to be very difficult to do. You know, the reason they want to get rid of these passive treatments is because they think they get in the way or of, uh, of of wanting to apply and use the time in the clinic for the higher value treatments, you know, that, that were suggested earlier. You know, and when low value treatments block high value treatments from being used, the chances of progressing our, our, um, ourselves as a profession also is, is sort of hindered, you know, so they make a little bit of sense on that. But at the same time, there are people who truly need this stuff. Um, and you know, out of curiosity, here this has happened to me. I, I've forgotten to push maybe the start button on an ultrasound machine, and I still have a, a client report that they're feeling better. And I've I've actually done thrust mobilizations maybe in the wrong side, opening versus closing, and yet they tell me that it's abolished their back pain. And how about performing like muscle energy techniques in the wrong direction when trying to um, correct uh, so-called SIJ? Um, uh, malalignment, you know. Really, what I did is I told a person to go in this direction, continue with their MET and home program at home for a week. And a week later, after doing it, they came back feeling great. And I looked on the chart and I told them the opposite direction. And theoretically, I should have been increasing and worsening their pelvic obliquity. You know, so we can um, we can all have some stories like that. And if you don't have any stories like that, you may have them in the future because the pain that we feel in our back is much more complex, again, than the anatomy that we simply treat and focus on. We're going to begin with um, K-tape for treating low back pain. Pereira et al. in 2014 did a systematic review that not supporting um, the use of kinesio tape in clinical practice. Uh, Kakar et al. in 2019 that, that found most interestingly the sham taping technique demonstrated promise for enhancing functional outcomes depending on the length of the tape that the, and the area that was covered. So basically the more tape that you used and the, uh, and the, uh, and the longer you made it, and you, the more you wrapped the person like a mummy, the better the functional outcome became. You know, so what 
do I tell my patients asking, so what does it do? You know, well, I tell one of them that uh, I believe that it may increase circulation, it inhibits tight tissue, facil facilitates weak muscles, or even reduces inflammation, but none of those have been proven by science to be true. And he responded with, really? Well, it works so well with me, and I was able to walk around the swap meet all day yesterday, you know? I said, perfect, you know. It looks like you are a rapid responder to the tape. You know, we can tape you maybe one to two more times, and you'll probably need this stuff um, th that many times, and after that, you won't need it anymore. You know, I believe that the most, um, the best medical equipment, and maybe the best clinicians in the world out there are the ones that make themselves obsolete the fastest. And I like to use the open label placebo statements when applying low value modalities because my conscience will not allow me to make up any unproven claim. A favorite metaphor of mine is to tell patients that the tape acts like training wheels and when assisting your body to move pain-free via potentially disrupting maybe long-standing pain neurotags until it learns how to do it on its own when repeated without pain. However, if you continue to use these training wheels, you will never accomplish your goal of learning how to ride a bicycle. You see, when we overuse this tape, um, it may become unhealthy for you. So just we just have to be really careful you know, that that doesn't happen. And by telling you how, how that it doesn't work, you know, how not it works and how it does work, and I have no idea how it works, is a bit embarrassing, I think, sometimes. But it's way better than pretending to know, than getting caught in a lie. That's even much more embarrassing for me. You know, so here's one thing that I thought was really interesting. You know, listen closely to this one. Fuentes et al. in 2014 found that sham e stim when the clinician connected with the patient was more effective than actual e-stim when the clinician did not engage with the patient. And what does that mean to me right there? Well, it's funny, right? That these studies tell me that the strong catalyst in the effectiveness of modalities such as electrical stimulation is so much more than just the current that runs through it. You know, I overheard one of our clinicians saying that he was going to sit by his patient's side and talk to them in order to correctly bill for this modality since some insurance companies no longer cover unattended e-stim. You know, I thought that was a great idea because, you know, instead of, instead of just shooting the breeze and talking with a patient, um, and, you know, it's the clinician that is the most active ingredient in how e-stim works. Uh, but instead of just talking to them and switching recipes and trading, um, uh, yeah, trading recipes and talking about the latest movie, I do have a few suggestions while chatting with the patients on e-stim, on hot packs, or on ultrasound or whatever. Why not do left-right discrimination too? You know, even practicing two-point discrimination around the body parts neighboring um, the effective area on their homunculus. Or even graphesthesia or grid localization. What about much more beneficial clinical experience? How about using e-stim around the knees or shoulders or when moving in challenging positions? You know, this way our patients could move in more comfort. This is one thing that should that we should not do. I mean, we should not for sure dis, uh, like connect patient to uh, a modality like traction or whatever, disconnect with them, walk away, do our notes, check on the internet, check our schedule. You know, we could, we could actually ref, um, redefine some of the goals if they've changed. Hey, do you still need to get up and down two stair steps that are in front of your house? And they'll tell me, no, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm, we're moving into another house and it doesn't have any stair steps in it. Can we change it? Because now I'm having a hard time getting up the driveway because it's much steeper. Right? That, I think, is a much more effective conversation to have when people are on e-STEM. What about IASTM? You know, Chetamat Allen, 2019, did what I feel is a lower-level study, but he did observe an, an improved uh, two-point discrimination and uh, pain pressure threshold in the first 24 hours, but not after 48 hours, of light pressure instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. You know, over the rectus femoris of healthy samples. <laughs> what does this tell me, you know? That I should use IASTM only on the first day of DOMS and not, only, and not afterwards uh, on healthy people who would most likely um, compete the next day. You know, that really doesn't fit, fit the, the demographics of patients that I see. You know, and I had the opportunity to be able to chat a little bit online with the person who created our edge mobility tool. And he said that really there was no difference between using the tool or using the hands. And the, the biggest benefit that the tool would provide 
is that it would save your hands. Now, I was also thinking that if I'm using this tool for very light touch only with brushing strokes on the skin, what exactly are the chances of my hands being worn down, you know, or overused or getting tired, especially if they're much stronger than just doing light, light tissue mobilizations? You know, his best description of what the tool does, I thought, was he quote unquote said paints the homunculus with them. You know, and to date, there's no evidence I'm aware of showing that these tools can physiologically break up scar tissue, change fascia, or release trigger points. Dry needling is also another thing that is not necessarily recommended, but I won't get into that because none of our clinicians or none of us here practice in the hospital using dry needling. Ultrasound, uh, that machine that you see on the top left, is not even mentioned in the CPG, CPGs, but has not been recommended to be used in studies since the since 1990s, you know, due to its medical claim not being superior to placebo. A quick Google Scholar search led me to Ward et al. 1994 concluding that patients are not likely to improve from ultrasound treatment. Uh, Chanel Meyer et al. 2017 found with their study about bone healing on an acute fracture that based on moderate to high quality evidence from studies in patients with fresh fracture, low intensity pulsed ultrasound does not improve outcomes important to patients and probably has no effect on radiographic bone healing. And I find it surprising that they still even study to this day. I found a, a study in 2019 on ultrasound that uh, stated we cannot recommend the use of monotherapeutic ultrasound for chronic low back pain or neck pain. They did find one out of the 10 included studies in that, um, uh, uh, in that uh, systematic review um, that uh, where ultrasound did significantly reduce pain intensity but suggests that it should be used in conjunction with other treatments you know, and I think it's such as uh, Therapeutic X. Uh, my take home from all this is that patients we determine need the use of ultrasound in conjunction with their therapeutic exercise treatment should not be misled into thinking ultrasound healed them or was primarily responsible for reducing their pain. That I feel would be fraudulent based on the evidence in a court of law. So what I do tell my patients is that when they ask me, so why am I using ultrasound on their back and why did I decide to use that? And I tell them it's because you told me it worked in the past and that it can help you again. You know, that's a, that's a big clue, I think. I usually will have a follow-up question to them saying that, well, what about ultrasound um, helped you the most back then? You know, no, normally they'll tell me that it helped break up my scar tissue and, and, and it helped with increased blood and oxygen and it helped get my circulation going to help heal me. You know, my next question would be, oh, where did you hear that from? You know, many times it's from Google, a friend, a family member, or sometimes even a clinician. And I share with them some of the compiled findings I have that the active ingredient in ultrasound may not be the energy it delivers since it has the same effect on healing people even when sound waves are not being delivered to the body. You know, so it's possible that the scientifically proven higher value treatments such as movement exercises you do each day have more potency in your recovery. You know, this is wonderful news because you were able to get rid of your pain using ultrasound 15 years ago, even when it didn't have the ability to necessarily break up the scar tissue. And we didn't know that back then, so that's what we told people. You know, we didn't know that it didn't inc increase circulation very sufficiently or even generate that much heat. Uh, we know better now, and you should be able to do the same thing and have the same successes again when we replicate something because it sparks a neural tag memory, a muscle memory, and a physiologic memory when we repeat stuff again and we repeat its successes again. You know, I just want you to know that it may have been other factors that have meant that, that were the the, the primary cause of potentially, you know, having you recover and bounce back all those years ago. Now, according to Kleiger et al. in 2018, analgesic placebos can lead to excellent clinical results for patients with chronic pain, idiopathic and neuropathic pain, uh, migraines, and knee osteoarthritis. You know, this is wonderful news because what we say cannot affect necessarily a whole lot, the, uh, the potency of the placebo. Whether we tell people uh, it doesn't work um, or, or we, we tell them um, it, it's, it's, it's uh, no better than a sham study or, uh, or not, um, 
it will still be effective in reducing and modulating and reducing their pain. You know, I just believe it is much more ethical to treat with an open label placebo since it still improves those outcomes even without the false claims. Um, now, over here, what on earth does trying to break up scar tissue look like? So the results over here that the normal and tangential forces required to produce a deformation of 9% compression, 4% shear on the skin were 50 newtons and 11 newtons respectively. Normal and tangential forces of about 100 newtons and 22 newtons were found for a similar deformation of fascia. For adipose tissue, these forces were 36 newtons, 8 newtons respectively. And in addition, the skin experienced more compression and shear about one and a half times as much as the fascia and the adipose tissue experienced about two and a half to three and a half times the deformation of the fascia and 50% more than the skin when given force that was applied to the skin. Now what is this now telling me? We deform a lot more skin than we do fascia, scar, tissue, or ligament, muscle, or tendon. We don't generate the amount of force required to significantly deform tissues beneath the skin during soft tissue mobilization thrust mobilization, or even IASTM. Therefore, any temporary decrease in stiffness perceived during palpation causing an increase in range of motion is most likely not closely related to a change in the tissue we are trying to specifically target. You know, my conclusion is that the forces applied to the surface of the skin were transmitted through this layer and the adipose layer entirely to the fascia Therefore, the skin and adipose tissue experienced the same magnitude of force as the fascia. However, the skin and adipose tissue experienced much more compression and shear than the fascia. So in order to break fascia down, you're going to have to get your patients to look like this. And I don't know if some of my patients would be agreeable to looking like this in order to just have some fascia broken down. I was also surprised to learn that the amount of force required to deform scar tissue, fascia, ligaments, etc., um, using instruments or tools may not even be enough to deform some of this stuff. So Chandra et al. in 2008 found that the fascia lata, a predicted normal load of 9,075 newtons, which is 925 kilos, a tangential force of 4,515 newtons, 460 kilograms, are needed to produce even 1% compression and 1% shear of the IT band. So such forces are far beyond the physiologic range of manual therapy. And I think that would include foam rolling the IT band. You know, a load of 8,359 newtons, or 852 kilograms, would be needed for the same effect, which is 1% in the plantar fascia. And to give you an idea of how much force this is, a small water buffalo, a carabao in the Philippines, is about 800 kilograms, and a medium-sized buffalo is about 1,000 kilograms. Now imagine the amount of force needed to change the IT band and plantar fascia 1% as the weight of a water buffalo placed on top of them, you know, rolling it out sideways. Conclusion, the palpable sensations of tissue release that are often reported by osteopathic physicians and other manual therapists cannot be due to deformations produced in the firm tissue, the plantar fascia and fascia lata. However, palpable tissue release could result from deformation in softer tissues such as the superficial um, nasal fascia. Okay, so if we don't elongate our patients um, and we perceive a stiff ITB, uh, uh, what exactly are we doing here? You know, so according to Willett et al. in 2016, who cut the IT band of 28 lightly embalmed cadavers and found that the Ober sign, which is one of our standard tests, uh, to test to see how tight the IT band is before we try rolling it out and loosening it up was not very influential in limiting abduction. Whether they cut it or not, it stayed exactly the same. You know, so uh, Shelp in 2003 suggests that practitioners report feeling a palpable tissue release with a particular stroke. This to me suggests that practitioners report of feeling that palpable tissues make them exist as individual perceptions like love, hate, or sorrow, rather than a physiologic measurable entity. Over here we got eight treatments to try even before manual therapy. And I love manual therapy because I'm a manual therapist. You know, at one time that's what I focused much of my treatments on. So this treatment wheel was designed by Lynn et al. in 2019 to provide us with many other treatment suggestions before applying manual therapy. 
Uh, we'll blaze through this really quickly, but number one is to focus on patient-centered care. We do great at that. Uh, screen for serious pathologic pathology or red flags. That's a biggie because some of the complex patients I see have very similar s symptoms as to what serious pathology may have. You know, so like Marfan's or it could be cancer, it could be all kinds of other ligamentous issues or MS. Um, assess psychological factors. That's number three, which is the Oribro and the Start Back tools are wonderful things for screening for that. Only use radiologic imaging if specifically indi indicated. And that includes like using models, I think, uh, to show and display to patients when trying to educate them. Undertake a physical examination, neurological screening test, assess mobility and or muscle strength. We do that all the time in all of our tests right now. Evaluate using outcome measures. We do that all the time right now of the ODI. Um, provide patient education on condition and management options. Okay. I think we do that pretty well. Uh, provide management addressing physical activity and or exercise. Um, and finally, number nine, here it comes, is apply manual therapy only as an adjunct to other evidence-based treatments. So we should never apply it on its own. It's got to be included with something of high value, such as Therex. Unless indicated, offer evidence-informed non-surgical care prior to surgery is number 10. And 11 is facilitate coordination or resumption of work. These flow diagrams, if you look at it by Bialowski et al. in 2008, show the complexities of how pain is created and how manual therapy affects it. So where on earth, if you look at the complexity of how to explain pain, do we even begin? You know, so now I'm a huge fan of simple explanations, but reductionism can be just as harmful as over complex explanations. You know, telling a patient that they're hurting because of a muscle imbalance, a bad posture, a bone spur or joint not being centered, or even a tissue tear, a thought or smell or stress or bulging disc or, or movement impairment or temperature is not accurate because it's a combination of everything that I just mentioned that makes a painful experience. Hodges et al. in 2019 states that pain is complex and it is no longer acceptable to consider pain solely as a peripheral phenomenal involving activation of nociceptive neurons. This means that even acti activating our danger um, sensors um, is not synonymous with pain or does not guarantee we will feel pain. So which tools should I keep? You know, again, we have an abundance of tools and tough question because they all work and they all work really well. Uh, uh, so this is a tough question again because the APTA uh, can also work well uh, because tools not recommended by the APTA can work very well with relieving the pain. And it's difficult to get rid of the tools that we love, that we've used for all the time, and we use just because they've been used all the time. Uh, and it also it makes people feel better. It makes us feel better when people feel better, right? So in 2013, uh, Farrell et al. found that Therapeutic Alliance was consistently a predictor of outcome for all the measures of treatment outcome. Meaning to say that the treatment technique didn't matter. We can use whatever we want. We can use uh, placebo. We can use Cottonborn. We can use McKenzie, Charmin, uh, Sarman. We can use uh, Maitland, kinesio tape, um, uh, soft tissue mobilizations, movement science. All have good results or poor results based on how well we connect with the patient. It's the connection that the clinician makes that make any of these things equally valuable. Okay? The words that we use and the beliefs that we create um, are what makes these tools in our toolbox work. We are the catalyst. You know? that make, that's very important because we cannot be replaced. You know, what's my point? These adjunct tools don't make clinicians effective. It's the clinicians who make these. They are the, we are the active ingredients, right? So furthermore, I don't think we should get rid of these tools simply because they lack the evidence to support their effect on the tissues, but we should try to at least stop making false claims uh, because that would discredit us. Um, we went through this test over here and here's, here's some good news because we get to keep all the tests. Uh, we just have to learn how to start reframing and explaining how they work using scientific supported claims. Uh, this is a website developed by Professor Peter O'Sullivan, Dr. Leo Neng, Neng and uh, Peter Edwards. Uh, and I highly recommend on bookmarking watching this several times because I know that we are all really busy and we all don't have the time to go check it out. 
So let's take a quick test together. Uh, and I think we just did the first two to three questions over here. Right. Um, I've become a huge fan over here. And for those who have watched me practice later, I've been experimenting you know, with heavy resistance training. A mantra that was made popular by Adam Eakins, you can't go wrong with getting strong. You know, and according to Darlow, in 2013, participants viewed lifting techniques, posture control, and muscle strengthening as strategies to protect the back. However, evidence does not support the idea that protection prevents pain. Rather, there is strong evidence that education and lifting techniques or reducing lifting loads does not prevent low back pain. So we will eventually get in our lives. But wouldn't you rather have pain and have an able, strong, powerful back versus you're going to get pain anyway and have a weak and deteriorating back and lose function. You know, so most of my clients are in the population of people that are 65 years and older and will be very reluctant to even try heavy weight lifting despite its benefits of protection. So I like showing them this video of Arnold and this I think came out last month where some clown jumps up and drop, drop kicks him in the spine and not even getting him damaged at all. You know, he looks like he just turned around and looks at him like, what the? So um, at 70 years old, how on earth did he make his body so durable? I mean, we all know Arnold lifts heavy weights. So just last week, Fragella et al. in 2019 published this fantastic journal titled A Properly Designed Resistance Training Program with Appropriate Instructions for Exercise Technique and Proper Spotting is Safe for Healthy and Older Adults. This is something that you really want to read. Uh, and it contains benefits uh, to training, which I like to share with patients who are reluctant to try uh, a lifting a bit heavier. You know, so one of them is reductions in C-reactive proteins for arthritis, helps with arthritis, helps reduce osteoporosis, mediates adaptations to resistance training, keeps having you grow, your tissues get stronger. Chronic kidney disease, it helps reduce that. Cardiovascular disease and hypertension helps reduce that. Chronic inflammation, it does really good at reducing that, and you saw that with C reactive proteins and um, the, 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 the non-inflammatory cytokines being more pro promoted uh, in, in the body. Mild congenitive impairments of dementia, it helps reverse and reduce. Mobility deficits, improving a psycho a psychosocial well-being. Uh, it increases uh, older adults' resistance to injuries and catastrophic events such as falls. It improves mobility, physical function, performance and activities of daily living, and preserves the independence. Who wouldn't want to be independent? Well, I don't know. Maybe there are some people who want to be dependent. But most of the people that I work best with are the ones that are striving for independence. Now, unfortunately, appropriate load for resistance training is something that does not often happen in rehab. Uh, for the most part, we tend to underload our patient, and we have to consider Wolf's Law, Davis's Law, and what, what the effects uh, of mechanotransduction and, and the overload principles uh, do when prescribing resistance to, to force and building strength um, to not just the muscles, but the nerves, the joints, the neurotags, the bones, the lymphatic and circulatory system of our patients. You know, all these items are highly woven together and cannot be isolated, so we can't just build one thing. We build it all. And unless red flags are detected, we should all focus on making our patients more durable. Since stretching, soft tissue mobilizations, you know, manual therapy are associated with making people weaker when it's off balance, and that's what we're doing more of to them when compared to heavy resistance training. So word of caution goes here, and as I want to, I want to make it sure, sure that we all don't go bonsai, and we don't start swinging the pendulum the other direction and start having our patients lift 150 pounds right off the bat. You know, this is an exaggeration, of course, but everything in moderation by using the stoplight model you see on the slide is the key to safety. The pictures on the slide are of people who have been physically active and lifting heavy for years and years and years, and the kind of resilience and durability they are displaying was not built overnight. No, this is a product of years of consistent training. Resistance prescription is yet another lengthy topic, and that uh, is another in-service that I would like to do. Uh, but I would also like to take a vote on who is interested in that, because I also want to learn more by doing more research and, and finding more about it. You know, the myth of core stability will continue here next, because I'm thirsty.